I think we're on, uh, Dina. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to this exciting talk by uh, Dr. Zena Kaya uh, on uh, Kurdish nationalism. You can see all the, uh, in relation to her uh, most recent book, uh, which is, um, you know, here, if you want to buy it, you will find it. I think Aki will put it in the chat. Um, so um, without further ado, Zainab is a graduate in um, uh, international relations from the LSE. She has been most recently, a, 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 you know, well, she has been teaching in international development and gender at SOAS. And she's also a visiting research fellow at the LSE Middle East Institute. Her work is uh, in, in, on transformation of Kurdish nationalism and territorial identity. And I think that will be the topic that she will, she will be speaking about. Um, she also has five years of experience as a postdoctoral uh, research fellow at the LSE. And her research interests are in gender, violence, uh, peace, development, uh, in Iraq, um, and particularly in relation to uh, Kurdish uh, nationalism. So the format of this talk, I will introduce myself at the end, the format of this talk, um, Zainab will talk for about half an hour to 40 minutes, and we encourage you to put your questions in the little tag that says Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom bar. And for those people joining from uh, Facebook, we will get co collect your questions as they come in. Once the talk is finished, I will pose the questions to Zainab and she will answer them um, in, you know, in order uh, of appearance. So first, first come, first served, um, but also depending on the importance and the relevance of the question to the topic. So this is the um, this series of uh, lectures and book launches is hosted by the SOAS Middle East Institute. And uh, it is, uh, we are, I am the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies. My name is Dina Mata. And uh, I have my colleague, Nargis Farzat, who is the chair of the Center for Iranian Studies. And we co-chair these meetings every Tuesday. And uh, we are supported by um, the excellent service of Aki El Borzi uh, from the SOAS Middle East Institute, who is uh, supporting and organizing all these events. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Zainab uh, and Zainab the floor or the screen is yours, really. Great indeed. Thank you, Dina, for the introduction and uh, thank you to you, Nargis and Aki for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about my book at, uh, at this um, event. Um, so as I will begin only, I will try to keep it short, um, not so that we don't bore the audience too much uh, with a long talk and then so that we have time for question and answers, uh, which I'm very interested in uh, hearing questions and answers. So I'll try to keep it as uh, short as possible. It's difficult to put um, a whole book into 20, 30 minutes talk, but I will do my best. Um, uh, this book is um, a, the, you know, I basically is, is based on my PhD research in, at the LSE in international relations. Um, and um, after um, after the PhD was over, um, uh, I put the put the project to the side basically, and I didn't touch it for a while. Um, and then I started rewriting it. So it went through a huge rewriting process. It has changed a lot from uh, from the PhD. Um, what it basically tries to do is to tell the story of the idea of Kurdistan um, and its territorial imagination. Uh, and while, while doing this, um, it tries to examine um, uh, and revisits the history of Kurdish nationalism. So that's kind of the main um, driving idea behind, behind the book. Um, so I'll first give you a brief overview of, um, of the case. I know most people are probably aware of, 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 of the case and its background, so I won't go into too much detail. I'll try to give an overview of the key arguments made in the, in the book um, and then uh, overview of the chapters. Um, so in terms of the Kurdish, uh, the Kurdish history, um, Kurds and in relation to their territoriality and the way they um, promote their idea of a homeland, of idea of territory, 
Um, as we all know, the Kurds have challenged the borders and national identities of the states they inhabit. Um, and this is particularly the case since the early 20th century, but we see uh, Kurdish nationalism uh, and different challenges being uh, posed in the 19th century as well. Um, and the, the map of Kurdistan, um, the greater map of Kurdistan, uh, which is a huge territory that encompasses uh, the territories of Iraq, Turkey, Syria and Iran, uh, also part of Armenia, is a, is a very evident symbol of, of this idea of, of territory. It, um, it, is a, it presents itself as a unified ideal homeland. Um, and this presentation is taking place in a region with a very complex history of ethnic, cultural um, and political background. Um, so it is a very heterogeneous geography um, it's been it's occupied historically and, and today uh, occupied by different ethnic uh, religious groups uh, such as Arabs, Turks, Persians, Kurds, Assyrians, Armenians, uh, Yazidis, Christians and many other groups that I um, I'll mention here. Um, and it's also um, a, a territory in which um, multiple uh, political uh, claims have been made over, over, over it, you know, from the uh, rivalry between the Safavids and the Ottomans um, in, the, in the previous centuries to the engagement of the international powers, uh, colonial powers in the region and their e efforts to control and different claims by the population living in the, in the region for their own kind of ownership of the territory from the Kurds, from Armenians, from Turks, from uh, Assyrians and so on and so forth. So it's a contested territory. Um, the main Kurdish political actors um, in each, so in the contemporary uh, world today, um, it, the Kurdish political actors in each country that Kurds are located uh, claim some ownership of, of, the, of territory uh, or control over a part of a state state's territory that they are located in. And they are usually careful to restrict their claims um, to within the state they reside. And uh, all these Kurdistans, so there are multiple Kurdistans, um, you know, in terms of the way they have been divided by these nation states, they have been uh, geographically, um, economically, uh, culturally marginalized in each state. Uh, and they have also historically been uh, buffer zones uh, between regional and colonial powers. Um, so basically the idea of greater Kurdistan is important because it rather than it, it presents Kurdistan and um, uh, puts Kurdistan at the center uh, rather than in the margins um, as it's been uh, presented uh, by other nationalists or by other nationalist projects in the region. The map of Kurdistan is very much embedded in the uh, consciousness of the majority of Kurdish people. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's, uh, well, this is the case both for the region and also outside the region, especially in the diaspora. Uh, the territory it depicts um, have never been recognized as a state. Uh, it does not have a unified uh, political leadership. However, the concept of Kurdistan uh, as a cultural and a political notion uh, survives the reality uh, and it exists in the minds of Kurdish nationalists, their supporters, uh, as, as well as those who deny it. Uh, the map of Kur Greater Kurdistan um, is frequently used um, in uh, Kurdish political programs. Uh, on political party flags, on the walls of homes and offices, um, its silhouette is even uh, you know has been used accessories as an accessory as key rings, brooches, or, or necklaces. Uh, however, what's particularly noteworthy is that it's not only Kurdish nationalists who use this map, but also outsiders use it to show uh, the location of the Kurdish homeland or to show the Kurdish demographic presence um, in the area. And this is basically the case for um, some state offices or um, international media. Uh, they use the, the contours of this map as well um, to show the demographic presence of the Kurds. Um, so why, why this project? Um, I, I, when I started uh, working on this project, um, in, uh, and I'm coming from an IR background, I've always been interested in uh, political history, um, a bit of a historical sociology, a long durée understanding of historical continuities and uh, and um, how uh, the long-term historical context and structures shape uh, contemporary political assertions. 
Um, and I'm also very much interested in uh, the role of geography and territory in, in, in politics. So I wanted to examine and understand the Kurdish political project uh, and its territoriality. And I think uh, because this is because it has important implications for thinking about um, national self-determination um, the idea of international uh, political legitimacy um, and how these are pursued, how these are used um, by non-nationalists, by non-state actors. Um, so it tries, I try to answer several questions, for instance, one of them is why and how uh, has the map of Kurdistan, has the map of greater Kurdistan become uh, such a widespread image? Um, you know, wh what is the, um, what, what bolsters this idea of Kurdistan um, and what is the um, perceived underlying relationship between nation and territory uh, that kind of gives resonance to this idea of Kurdistan map. So when I talk about widespread use of Kurdistan map, it doesn't mean that everyone uses this map. It doesn't mean that everyone accepts this map. Um, so um, there is no, um, it's, it, does, it also doesn't mean that not every Kurd or uh, those who are supporting the Kurds are aiming for a unified Kurdistan in the ways in which this map is depicting. Um, and uh, so, however, it has a resonance, it has, it has a symbolic importance, and it does also has a political importance. Um, many, many would claim that, especially nationalists would claim that um, the relationship between nation and territory that map, this map seems to uh, project is a straightforward relationship. Uh, so it is, it's, it's the Kurdish territory, so this is Kurdistan, or, um, it, it, it's the idea that it depicts um, a people's natural and actual homeland. Um, and for most Kurds, it's certainly the case. Um, so more for its supporters, the map of Greater Kurdistan um, makes the case that Kurds are a nation uh, without a state whose homeland has been divided by four states. Uh, so this is this is the case. But what I want to what I want to do in the book is to push beyond this question of whether Kurdistan is actual, whether it's viable. Uh, what I want to uh, try to avoid, you know, I, I'm not interested, I'm not looking into whether this Kurdistan, Kurdistan as a, as a territory exists or not, because clearly um, I, I believe that territorial imaginations or territory and identity, any territory and any identity, including state territories, including state identities, these are constructed, these are politically, historically, socially constructed, economically constructed notions. Um, they are not necessarily natural or perennial ideas uh, that have always existed and that will always exist. Uh, and this is the case for, I think, any, any homeland, whether it's real homeland, I mean, it, it, not real, it, I don't mean real, but whether it is, it is a homeland that has been internationally recognized as an entity, as a nation state or not, that doesn't matter. It, it doesn't make it any less constructed, even if it's recognized. Um, so um, that, that's kind of, so that's why I wanted to push beyond that idea of where does this Kurdistan map come from? Where, where, why, uh, where does this nation and territory idea, the connection uh, is coming from and how has, this, has that been established and how has that changed and transformed over time historically? Uh, and I wanted to forge a connection between uh, the evolution of the idea of Kurdistan uh, and the international political context. Um, so I, the, the ways in which uh, international political legitimacy, principles such as self-determination, sovereignty have changed and transformed, their meaning and implications have changed and transformed. And as, as also international politics, um, the, the, the you know, geopolitics and the politics, these transformations historically in the long term have affected the ways in which Kurdistan as an idea has changed and evolved. So I want to, in the, in the basic book, tr I try to trace this connection between the international uh, context um, and the Kurdish political project, uh, the territorial project, and uh, show the links between the two. Um, and that's basically a brief introduction to what the book is trying to do. And um, I, more specifically, I try to do three things in the book. As I mentioned, uh, I want to discuss the link between people and territory uh, in the case of Kurds and Kurdistan. 
and um, explore how this link is articulated and how it has evolved over time and why it has evolved in the way it has. Um, and um, here in this in this context, political maps, um, I, I talk, go into the little bit of the literature on political maps and, and ge political geography, how much political maps are powerful tools in uh, presenting the idea of a homeland. Uh, they have the power to shape people's images of the world, as we have seen, you know, we see in the, in the world map, for instance, you know, immediately that image um, starts, has some assumptions uh, and those assumptions resonate with the way we see, we see the world and vice versa. Um, so they are visual expressions of apparently homogeneous um, national territories and in reality, actually, political maps are not simply reflections of how the world territory is partitioned. Um, they are the outcomes of political projects and imaginations as well. And in return, uh, these imaginations, these visual uh, presentations shape our perceptions of the world territory. Uh, so that's kind of the, uh, for building on that idea, what's more important I think is to um, understand the narrative these maps have been situated within. Um, what type of uh, lenses are we using to understand uh, and interpret ter territoriality? Uh, territoriality being the relationship between nation and territory. Um, and uh, how, how co conceptions of nation, national identity, identity itself or territoriality uh, have different meanings in different historical periods from in the 19th century, in the colonial uh, period, they had different connotations in different geographies. In the World War One process, again, they, you know, obtained and started to have different uses and, and definitions. Again, different in the uh, Cold War period, in the decolonization, uh, the post Cold War period, uh, and you know, so I trace all these major historical processes and then situate the, the these concepts in relation to Kurdistan. Uh, and I think this map, um, what I found very useful, in my opinion, is that. Um, it's very useful, the map of Greater Kurdistan and the Kurdish case, I think, in general, is, is, is a very rich and um, useful case to explore wider questions around map self-determination and territory. It helped, helps us, I think, navigate through a complex temporal and conceptual field uh, in which ideas of self-determination and territoriality have changed and evolved over time. Um, so basically that's kind of one of the one of the key aims of the book. Um, the second uh, aim is to situate the Kurds within the international um, political and normative framework. Uh, so I try to uh, understand the transformation of the historical historical evolution of, of uh, the norms of legitimacy in the world, rules of legitimacy in the world and particularly in the Western world. Um, because uh, of the engagement of the Western actors in, in the Ottoman territories and in, in, the, in the Kurdistan area. Um, it looks at dominant rules of legitimacy in different historical periods and examines how Kurds position themselves within that normative framework and its politics. Um, and Kurds not only uh, were, in, they were, the, 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 the analysis shows that the Kurds were not just, um, passive actors in this process. They were actually actively incorporating these ideas, interpreting them in, the, in, their, in their own way and incorporating them into their political agendas and using them um, both within their own national project in their mobilization efforts, but also in the ways in which they try to seek support in the international fora uh, from the international actors in the, in the conferences in, in, in several platforms. Um, and indeed, uh, the map of Greater Kurdistan um, has been developed and communicated through the use of the dominant international norms uh, that give legitimacy to nationalist demands. Um, and uh, self-determination is the key concept, is the key norm, which, which is, has a, a heavily focused on uh, throughout the book. And I trace the transformation of self-determination throughout the book. Um, and then, um, so I try to trace the uh, historically trace the meaning of self determination and how what it meant for the Kurds and Kurd several Kurdish political agendas in different historical periods. And thirdly, uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'll briefly try to explain what I how I tried to do that in in my summary of the chapters. But the third thing I tried to do in this uh, in this book was to move. Um, 
contribute to the literature on Kurdish politics and Kurdish nationalism by uh, focusing um, on them with a non-state centric perspective. Uh, most of the Kurds, you know, most of the studies, and uh, there is a, the, the Kurdish literature is getting richer and richer, to be honest, and it's been for the last 20 years, it's grown a lot. Uh, but most of the political analysis uh, on the Kurds it focuses on each Kurdish group within each state and very much uh, studies it in relation to the, the politics of the each state they are located in. Um, there aren't many work that looks at the Kurdish politics as a totality in the long term or, or, or how um, they engage with the international context and the international analysis is usually done in the context of foreign policy analysis, how the Kurdish um, Kurds um, have an impact on each state's foreign policy and so on and so forth. So what I try to do is to uh, move away from a state-centric examination of Kurdish politics and try to explain Kurdish political actors directly engaging with the international context, treating Kurdish national actors as international actors. Uh, and indeed, they have been international actors right from the beginning uh, as non-state actors um, since the 19th century. Um, therefore, I think um, it's important to have this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of lens, I think, provides different insights on, on the case. And as I think also it gives us the opportunity to drive uh, ideas and lessons for the wider theoretical conceptual issues that we discuss in politics, in international relations, uh, and to the historical examinations, uh, because it's, as I said, it's a rich case. Um, it has, um, it has a, it's and it's situated in a very complex geography and a historical context and therefore uh, there is a lot to be gained uh, with, from engaging with the Kurdish politics uh, more theoretically and conceptually. So that's basically what I um, try to do <laughs> with the book in general uh, conceptually. Uh, so the um, if I wanted to go into what I did in each chapter more specifically, and I will try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, in the first chapter, um, so after introduction, um, the, the chapter looks into the um, Kurdish territoriality under the Ottoman rule. Um, and it, it's basically offers an analysis uh, of the conceptual and historical underpinnings of the idea of Kurdistan and its later geographic manifestations. Um, this chapter tries to explain um, uh, the attribution of modern meanings of territory and nation. So it basically, we, we, most, in most of the uh, analyzers or most of the perspectives takes the conceptions and ideas of nation and territory as we understand them today and then apply to the past territories and nations. And, and that retrospective, um, Luke does not always give us the correct kind of understanding of what territory meant back in the time or what Kurds meant with their idea of nationhood. And uh, so I'm not claiming to say um, I'm, I'm giving answers to this one, but I'm just basically trying to question these things and try to understand the uh, the underpinnings of the idea of Kurdistan uh, in this context um, and um, look at the how how Kurdish nationalist historiography understands and have defined Kurdistan, how it has embedded the idea of Kurdistan into the into this historiography. Uh, it looks into uh, territoriality of the tribal leaders, for instance, who revolted against the Ottomans in the 19th century. So that's basically, uh, and it traces the idea of the concept of Kurdistan, for instance, going back to the uh, 12th century, um, uh, its uses and then how these uses have been used in the nationalist historiography and what it means for the Kurdish nationalist agenda uh, and, and uh, historiography. So that's kind of what the first chapter does. The second chapter is um, on the orientalist views of national identity and colonial maps of Kurdistan. Um, this one focuses on the maps of Kurdistan produced on, in the 19th century and early 20th centuries. Uh, by Western travelers um, and colonial officers. And here um, I try to situate this, uh, these within the um, conceptions of uh, Western or colonial conceptions of what nation is, what self-determination is, who deserves to be a nation, you know, this very um, civilizationist, modernist, 
colonialist understandings of, of nationalism and national identity and you know so certain states or certain nations are worthy of being a nation so that's a very kind of top-down understanding of that and I think that discourse has very much shaped the way in within which Kurdish politics and Kurdish groups or Kurdish uh, project has understood today as well and uh, this idea that you know Kurds don't have a unified I you know political agenda they are divided and uh, they don't agree with each other uh, all these things you see in the writings of western travelers um, and this is usually presented as something negative uh, because when they don't have a political leadership they won't be able to establish their own state uh, however these are perceptions that are coming from a particular colonial context and i think sometimes unfairly describes uh, the kurdish politics for instance today um, when we look at the Kurds, again, one of the biggest criticisms is that it's, a di it's divided, it's, it's diversified, it's divided, et cetera, and et cetera. And indeed, this does create a lot of impediments for the Kurdish political project uh, and causes problems. But at the same time, um, we, we, we need to kind of think about the lenses that we are using about what is national identity, what is unification. And you know, we are. If you look at the Kurdish case with those assumptions, then we might see the situation in a negative way. But if we see this diversity as a um, as a source of adaptability and survival, um, this could be the case as well. Because Kurds, despite being in a very difficult political historical context, have managed to survive and has managed to adapt themselves to the different uh, political climates and issues. So um, I underpin those ideas basically in this chapter, looking into the colonialist assumptions about nationhood and then how these were used to define the Kurdishness, the idea of Kurdishness and Kurdistan. <clears throat> and th these sources actually have become sources of mapping for by Kurdish political actors as well. This chapter that's following that is um, looking into the particular period, uh, World War I period, where Wilsonian self-determination became an international norm. Um, uh, and then this is the period where the hopes for Kurdistan rose and fall. Um, and uh, it explains how Kurdish nationalism adapted, adapted, adopted the, uh, into, to, adapted actually to the international framing for legitimate statehood, what does legitimate statehood mean? And then they try to frame their project in, in, in within that context. Um, and this period was the height of Kurdish hopes for statehood, as I mentioned, but these did not come to fruition. And Kurdish political elite presented um, in this process their Kurdistan maps to international authorities to receive support for their project. Uh, and like sim similar to many other groups all around the world that did that in the Versailles conference. So it looks into those uh, processes and then connects again the project with the, to the international um, political and normative context. The other uh, chapter following that is uh, decolonization, uh, Kurdish nationalism during decolonization and the Cold War. Uh, this is, I think, a, you know, a very significant period for, for uh, state formation worldwide, especially in the, uh, in the, de in the decolonization process. Um, and in this process, the Kurds did not try to tap into these, um, you know, the decolonize, decolonization self-determination notion, but it didn't, uh, it wasn't, it, in the end, it wasn't useful for them. But in this process, Kurdish nationalism in, in, in all the contexts um, became a, a more, more of a mass movement. Um, they, uh, they increased their ability to mobilize and, and uh, most of the Kurdish groups adapted themselves to the political, ideological uh, positioning, uh, you know, align themselves with the more kind of Mar Marxist-Leninist ideologies, um, and, um, and they, they diversified in, the, in, in that sense. Uh, <clears throat> so I tried to understand uh, the transformation of Kurdish nationalism in this very long process uh, where <clears throat> the international political uh, context was very much ideologized I, I, it was ideologically divisive politically divisive and Kurds navigated this context really actually effectively and and their interactions across the borders uh, between like Turkey and Iran uh, Syria and uh, uh, and Turkey their con connections increased they always had connections they always had, you know um, cross cross et cross border ethnic connection was always there, and political affiliations were there. But this increased uh, over time, and this is also the period when 
um, you know, communication tools started to be used more and more, like radio transmissions, um, and that, that type of technology also had a huge impact. And this is also a period when most of the um, Kurdish political dissidents uh, sought asylum in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, and this also added another momentum to, to the transformation of Kurdish nationalism. So I look into those processes, both in the region and, and internationally. And then the fifth chapter looks at Kurds and international society after the Cold War. Here, um, obviously self-determination and state formation or state legitimacy changed again uh, with the end of the Cold War. Uh, issues around human rights, state legitimacy, um, fragile states, um, you know, states' responsibilities around uh, protection uh, and so on and so forth democracy. Um, and uh, we see, again, Kurdish political actors very effectively transitioning in this process as well and, and tapping to this international normative context with so this new emerging context and, and adapting themselves accordingly. Um, and this, this basically, these, uh, trans, these trans, newly transformed international norms and bec that became embedded over time uh, were used to frame and shape the goals of each Kurdish nationalist group. And um, I feel like I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to try to conclude. Uh, the sixth one is the Kurdish diaspora. So I, I dedicated a separate chapter to the Kurdish diaspora. Um, obviously, this chapter covers a long historical period. Um, this looks at how Kurdistan map uh, goes, went global, um, how um, the role of Kurdish activists in the diaspora uh, were influential in making the map of Greater Kurdistan a widely used symbol of Kurdish territoriality. Um, and the Kurdish diaspora managed to uh, combine the prevalent normative and political discourses of human rights, um, justice, and democracy uh, with their identity-based territoriality. Uh, and they promoted more so than the uh, Kurdish political actors in the region, uh, a pan-Kurdish idea. Not all the diaspora actors, but you know, this, this pan ideas became more prominent in the Kurdish, in the diaspora context. Um, and um, so I, there are, and then the, you know, the, 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 map, the map became uh, a more visual tool a more, much more used, wide, widespread use tool um, among the Kurds. Also outsiders began to uh, use this map, this political map uh, to depict the demographic location of the Kurds in this, in this context. Uh, and the final chapter basically offers a recap of, of these, uh, of these issues and you know make some assessment of the uh, post Syrian war context and the, the impact on the direction of Kurdish political uh, project uh, and that's basically uh, I hope uh, not very long uh, summary of the of the ideas in the book um, and thank you very much for listening and I look forward to the questions. Okay, thank you very much, Zina. That was really very concise, and you don't go over time. You actually went within the time limit. Um, but thanks a lot. May I may I begin by I, we've got a lot of questions around maps and you know mapping and people asking um, why you know about even connections to the um, to the cover of the book and 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 uh, the idea of maps and so on. Um, but I want to think. I want to ask, maybe if I may, um, in relation to your last uh, chapter, which is on the diasporas, um, do, do you do you engage with questions of solidarity, you know, politics with with the uh, with, with, with the Kurdish populations, and and uh, or or is that a question that you did not um, approach at all? Um, absolutely, I I look into um, the ways in which. Um, you know, this idea of co-ethnic presence in different host states um, and uh, galvanizing support for uh, the homeland um, and, and promotion of the uh, ideal homeland, but also the, um, uh, the account of the um, violations of human rights and political rights in the region and what the states are doing and the um, and 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 make, make, you know informing the um, international audiences about what's going going on in these countries. So that has been a huge uh, component of the diaspora. Not all the diaspora, obviously. You know the politically active Kurdish diasporas work, um, 
So there has definitely been um, signs of strong signs of uh, solidarity in the in, in historically, but especially we saw this particularly visibly in the um, in the in the uh, post you know Syrian war or after after the Syrian war um, and when ISIS was attacking, for instance, um, Kobani and and uh, what was going on in Rojava. There, a, a huge international um, solidarity effort was was developed uh, in support of uh, of the Kurds on the, on the ground that were fighting against uh, against ISIS, but also those who were um, affected by by violence and conflict. Okay, thank you. I'm going now to pose some questions from the audience. Obviously, the first question was about whether we could see some maps. Yeah, uh, I've prepared them actually. If you um, I'm happy to show them now, or if you want to ask other questions while I'm preparing them. Okay. Um, now, uh, so the next question, uh, would it be easier for the Kurds if they leave the P PKK line? I mean, the communist phrase is very controversial in, in Europe, especially Eastern Europe. Yeah. Um, so perhaps you could comment on this uh, particular point. Um, in the Europe, so the, for the, oh, if they leave the PKK line, yes. Um, Oof, um, it's a difficult question because um, obviously, you know, the PKK um, has a, it, it's a it's a it's a big organization. It has been around for decades, and it has become a, a, a key actor in Kurdish political um, uh, in the Kurdish political movement. And um, many Kurds would argue that those who are explicitly supporting PKK or not, uh, that many achievements have been done thanks to the sacrifices that PKK has made over time. So um, for, for political actors, the Kurdish political actors, again, uh, you know, even though they don't want to support PKK directly or they don't explicitly openly support it, but they can't, they don't really deny it either um, or uh, or say, you know, we have no in a relationship with them or we don't recognize them as, as a representative because um, the, the, the transformation and formation of Kurdish political um, movement has been in connection with the PKK's movement as well as other political actors uh, in Iran, in Syria, in Turkey uh, and in Iraq. Therefore, you know, but because I have a historical lens and approach in general, um, I would say it's very difficult to. Uh, this is a political question, I guess, uh, and I, as an academic, I may not be able to answer that. But I, I also understand the reasoning behind this question because um, the communist line or the PKK line or the kind of Marxist line has been a, a disadvantage for the for the Kurdish movement, uh, especially during the Cold War period and after the Cold War. Although you know, with, with with the USSR, they had strong connections and links, and today um, uh, this agenda uh, does not necessarily fit in with the Western kind of normative framework, uh, and then this limits their ability to forge um, relationships, uh, alliances with the Western uh, actors. Not that this is desirable; they may not, you know, it's, I'm not saying this is a desirable relationship, but. In a very volatile region, those kinds of connections sometimes end up being useful as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's all I will say about this question. I'm, not, I'm sorry, it's not a clear answer, but that's kind of my thinking uh, in relation to the question. Thank you. That's fair enough. Um, and then there's another question asking about, you know, we hear more about um, Kurds from uh, Iraq. But would you have uh, any comments about Irani, uh, Irani Kurdistan, or uh, you know discourses from them? Uh, is uh, did you provide in the book any information on Kurds um, in Iran? Yeah, yeah, um, yes, absolutely. So I told quite extensively about the Mahabad Republic uh, that was established in 1946, and during right after the Second World War, um, when the uh, zones were created in, under the control of the USSR and, and the Western Allied forces and, and, and Iran. In that context, the Kurdish political actors saw an opportunity to create a, a republic, uh, which lasted 11 months. So I talk uh, quite a bit about that, which is a really I think, milestone in the Kurdish national historiography. Um, it's the only statehood that they, they, uh, they formed, that they attained. They attained. And um, it was a republic that was quite ahead of its time, uh, quite progressive. 
Um, so I talk about that. And then I also talk about the Kurdish movements um, in the Cold War period, um, you know, how they were caught in the, you know, the Islamic, re Islamic revolution um, and, and all that internal Iranian political context, how that ended up, um, and also the uh, kind of this perceived relationship, close relationship between Iranian identity and Kurdish identity and how much this has shaped the Kurdish nationalist movement or Kurdish national identity in Iran slightly different than, than in Turkey. I mean, I think in every state, the Kurdish national identity has transformed in the, in the last hundred years differently. So I look, talk about that particular context of Iran um, and then uh, the current position of the Kurdish movements, how much they are, have become quite marginalized and they are quite active or more active in the border areas. Um, whereas in other air in the other uh, states, I guess the Kurdish political movements are a bit more visible and more in influential and more central. Um, but the Kurdish Iranians have always had very strong connections with the other other Kurdish groups, um, especially the Iranian and and Turkish groups. And PKK also has been organizing in Iran for a long time. So there's a lot of alliances and co co Kurdish uh, connections going on across the border. Um, in that context. But I have to admit, it is a, a context that I know the least about the Iranian uh, context, which is my fault. But also, you know, I guess um, uh, not much research has been done. It's coming up now. But when I was doing my PhD in the in the 2000s, um, it was mainly discussed in the context of Iranian state and historical processes. So um, but I, that literature is developing, which is which is great. Fantastic. Okay, so a question around the language, you know, the role of language, and uh, another question, which is um, uh, whether uh, you could say something about Kurdish nationalism, whether it's based on the concept of a sovereign nation state, or whether it is envisaged to include degrees of autonomy within a larger polity, like, for example, Wales or Scotland within the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So how is it talked about uh, in terms of the Kurdish nationalistic discourse uh, and, um, the, and the language question. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be able to say that there is one Kurdish nationalist discourse. Um, there are different Kurdish nationalist movements, even within Turkey, for instance, you know, Kurdish desires around statehood, autonomy, uh, or non autonomy, um, they, they all exist. Uh, but if we talk about the you know main uh, the biggest political Kurdish actors in the Middle East, mm. if we say one of them is like you know the Iraqi political parties KDP and PKK and the other being um, PKK. Um, the PKK historically initially was demanding independence, separation, um, but they gave up it. They gave up that goal um, and they said they want. Um, a solution within the borders of Turkey. Um, and they talk about um, autonomy a lot, uh, but uh, the, their political leader, um, Öcalan, has developed this idea of um, democratic confederalism, uh, which is um, emphasizing local democracy. It has um, you know, elements of anarchy uh, in it, you know, very localized uh, democracy. Um, where uh, the power is um, dispersed and the, the, the possibility of connection between different, so it's horizontally connected, and not a vertical kind of system, but a horizontally uh, connected system uh, and, and autonomous regions or, or local, local democracy. That's kind of the idea. Um, mm. And it's, it's, it's very different from the Western typical national nation state idea. They, don't like the idea of nation state. They think it's the at the root of the lots of problems that the people in the Middle East are experiencing, not only the Kurds, but also others. Mm. Um, whereas the KRG model, for instance, uh, mainly, I guess, promoted by the KDP is more, you know, nation state uh, focus is at least it adopts that kind of idea more. Uh, although officially, um, uh, the leadership talks about, you know, they, they want to be part as a federal in a, within a federal Iraq, they want to maintain their regional autonomy. Uh, but once in a while, this idea of you know independence comes up, um, um, and I guess you know 
they might be perceiving in the long term uh, a possibility of this regional autonomy transforming into a statehood uh, in the long term. And that's definitely, I think, their aspiration. Um, and they want to do this through uh, being closely allied with the, uh, with the Western uh, states, uh, especially the US and the UK. Um, but then when, when we talk about there are multiple, so many Kurdish political actors. There's as many in many contexts. You know, in many contexts, there are so many Kurdish or Turkish or Assyrian. You know, there are multiple uh, political agendas, and they all have different ideas and conceptions about this. So, what I describe now, what I provide here, doesn't necessarily uh, correspond to all the existing uh, positions um, in the region that the Kurdish uh, political actors adopt or the um, uh, ordinary Kurdish people, uh, the Kurdish populations uh, mm. perceive. Okay, thank you. Uh, this kind of comes to, a, a, you know, the, the fact that uh, the Kurdish people's view of nationalism or the nation state, uh, there's a related question, which is uh, quite interesting, which is, uh, you know, the question of maps and the map, uh, you know, so one, uh, one attendee said that I saw the map on the advert for the meeting and would like to hear a bit more about the significance of maps to Kurdish people. And in relation to this, another question, when did the first attempts to map the greater Kurdistan start and why? Um, I think you touched on that, but maybe you could, yeah. you could answer yeah, that. Sure. Let me, let me actually open the figures and can I share my, I'm not sure if I'm a host, whether I can share my screen. Um, I think you can. Uh, yes, I'm a co-host now, so I'm just going to share some of the um, images. So the, the map is really, um, so this is, let me share my screen. Um, yeah. So yeah. for instance, this is, a, this is the map produced by Sheriff Koshi, who was the representative to the uh, Versailles conference, Kurdish delegation, uh, leader of this Kurdish delegation, that was only a very, very small, you know, I think he was the only person that was in the delegation. Uh, so he prepared this map of Kurdistan and he presented this map. He wrote a memorandum uh, for uh, that accompanied this map. Um, and um, uh, but then he wasn't recognized as the representative of the Kurds by other Kurdish political actors in the region. So some of the Kurdish political actors um, uh, sent telegrams to, to the conference saying, you know, Sheriff Pasha doesn't represent us and so on and so forth. So this is one of the, this is one of the key, I think the first official example of a map that was produced by a Kurdish political actor. Might you be able to make a bit, make it a bit larger? It's only just, I don't know if you can double, you know, click on. So the, this is, I got this from an archive. So it's oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Actually, yeah. I might have a redrawn version of this. I have a redrawn version of this in the um, in, in the, the book. In the book. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, and then this is, for instance, another map. Um, this is by a modern scholar, uh, Marda Izadi, and he. Uh, this is a more of a demographic map, but as you can see, the contours of the map very much corresponds to the map of Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. um, this is a more kind of modern, uh, produced in the 1990s. Um, this is um, another Im image that I use. This is more like internet-based mapping attempts uh, by, by the Kurds about where are the Kurds. Um, this is a map uh from a by the cia in the 1980s or i think it's going back to 1960s map mm -hmm. of kurdistan it's, it's very unclear but if you, you can see this very vague you know light color uh, here mm -hmm. um that kind of is depicting um the map this is a, a map produced by um david mcdowell in his book uh showing distribution of kurds but again the map very much corresponds to the shape of the corresponds to the Kurdistan map. Uh, what's interesting about the Kurdistan maps is that over time they just get bigger and bigger um, uh, geographically, and and some of the maps have connections to the, for instance, to the Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm. um, this is a map, for instance, used by the Washington Post, um, and there are several examples of such maps being used. It, they are called Kurdish populated area or Kurdish inhabited area, but you come across 
this map in, in the economies in Washington Post in other um, international sources. Um, let me see if I have any other historical maps. I so I, I can't find the other maps. Where are they? Oh, that's okay. Yeah, so, so the question of what was the question? Um, it is very important. I think the main thing is that the Kurdish political, Kurdish nationalism, uh, there are discussed different opinions about when Kurdish nationalism began, when did it become a nationalist political movement, and different scholars are, have different are ideas about this. But there is no doubt that the World War I period was a really key process, you know, in the uh, in the culmination of, of this idea of Kurdish nationalism uh, as, as, the, as, a, as a ideal for a statehood. Uh, and this became more explicitly expressed by by Kurdish nationalists and Kurdish political groups, and this period also corresponds with massive international mapping effort in the world. Um, so, if you just look at World War One and post World War One period, so um, in that context, you know, I think there is an interesting connection between um, how much mapping, even more so than before, I think was used as a tool by international, by, by local, by any actor in the world, uh, in the transformation of the world, transitioning from monarchical regimes and empires into nation states. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, and the, I think the, the, the emergence of Kurdish uh, political movement as a more kind of nationalistic and more visible movement, there is a coincidence temporal coincidence there. And I think in that process, mapping uh, became a really key um, tool as well for the Kurds because it corresponded with the historical context yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so we've got a few, you know, a lot, a lot more questions coming in very quickly. Um, Am I giving too long answers? Maybe I should keep my answers yeah, short. Sure, that... um, so there's a question. I, I'm just going to try and, and get to, uh, the two together. Uh, together. So there's a question about whether you could talk a bit about overlapping authorities with high Kurdish and Armenian populations in Anatolia, uh, Treaty of uh, Sabres 1920, uh, how did this treaty affect the issue and so on. Um, and then uh, in the case of uh, Kurdistan maps, how important have they been for Kurdish nationalism within Turkey? And uh, yeah, I think if you could answer these, and then there was a question about Western travelers map, if they were a lot, and how did they affect the way Kurdistan is imagined today? Um, so basically, these are the questions related to territorial, uh, ter territory and, uh, and maps, and then we, I'll put together other questions as we yeah. go on. Um, the Armenian question, um, it's a uh, I can go on and on about that, but um, definitely there, there was a there was a rivalry between the Armenian and Kurdish political projects in the World War One period after the collapse of the uh, Ottoman Empire, and and but the Armenian delegation in the Versailles Conference was much more effective and was was much better organized and very much supported by the Armenian diaspora, so they were more effective in. Uh, communicating their their goals and you know also their relationships with the um, uh, great powers of the time was stronger. Um, so there was definitely you know the Kurds didn't have that kind of um, um, influence, um, if that's the right word. Um, and then uh, there were debates around you know you know that the the Sheriff Pasha um, uh, drew the map, uh, but took the Van Lake region, which is considered as, as a key part of the Armenian homeland out. He put he, he kept, that, kept that part out of the out of his map. Um, and then uh, and it was argued that he made this in, 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 you know, they made a deal with the Armenian leader, basically, that was the delegation. And that was one of the key things that was he was criticized by the other Kurdish political actors saying, you know, this area is also Kurdistan, you know, you can't exclude that. So there was that going on. Um, and um, uh, in that process, basically, you know, the Eastern Turkey became like, it, it was an area that was up for grabs. Turks, Kurds, Armenians would have become a mandate uh, under the British rule. Um, and Russians were very influential as well, as, at least until 1917, until the, revo the revolution. 
Um, so it was an arena of uh, huge international political rivalry. Um, so in that context, basically, um, uh, after the after the uh, the Sevres agreement, basically, uh, gave the Kurdish uh, opened the possibility of a Kurdish statehood, uh, but all and with, with lots of really strict conditions actually. It didn't actually propose a Kurd. When you look at Article 64, 65, it's not openly saying uh, permitting a Kurdish state, but it's just establishing some procedures and possible uh, certain rules around that. Uh, but and you can see, you know, it's quite conditional uh, and 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 quite unlikely. And then with the um, uh, with the with the, with the Ottoman Empire. You know, uh, the, 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 basically the Serb agreement was never, treaty was never uh, ratified. Uh, and the newly emerging Turkish uh, political movement, Tur Turkish movement basically rejected it. And then a, a new treaty was signed, Lausanne. And Lausanne uh, treaty was basically the end, end of the idea of Kurdistan uh, in that sense. Um, however, the, um, the provisions of the SEV was partly implemented in, in Iraqi Kurdistan. So uh, uh, an autonomous region of Sleimania, Kurdistan, around Sleimania was, uh, was created. Um, and this lasted for, for a while, but then the, the, its leader um, it declared independence. And this was under the British mandate. And then there was back, back and forth. Uh, and basically, the British uh, ended. The, this autonomous region, but that was kind of, uh, a, you know, a, a, an implication of the SEV treaties um, provision. Okay, there are several questions around the inter-Kurdish uh, conflicts and between, uh, you know, kind of conflicts between Kurds with different views uh, amongst us in different uh, within different territories. Um, and how does that relate, there's a question that, how does that relate to the idea of a Kurdish nationalism or whether you are talking about Kurdish nationalisms in the plural? So the questions kind of relate uh, to each other. So if you could comment on uh, or whether you kind of looked at inter-Kurdish uh, conflicts, for example, um, in, in, in terms of... Uh, conflicts in Turkey, Iran, Syria, and Iraqi Kurds, that damage cooperation and unity between the Kurds and so on. Um, would you have any comments yeah. on that? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was tracing the um, historical evolution of Kurdish political movement, I was also doing, looking into the regional context uh, and how it's changing and transforming. Um, so while there were, um, you know, I think the, in the Kurdish, when you look at the Kurdish history, intra-Kurdish conflict was there and still is there, uh, and intra-Kurdish collaboration is also there. Um, and, uh, in, and But some of these intra-Kurdish divisions have been quite harmful, uh, particularly, for instance, the divisions within Iraqi Kurdistan between PUK and KDP. Uh, basically, it's like a two-state system in, in, the K in, in the Iraqi Kurdistan region. Or um, the... Um, the, the rivalry, the regional more kind of live rivalry between PKK and KRG. Uh, and if there are like kind of uh, armed, you know, conflict between them, they might have stayed quite a small scale. But in the past, in the 1990s and 1980s, uh, there has been more kind of a slightly larger scale um, uh, military kind of engagements between, between these groups. And there has also been collaborations, uh, for instance, in the in the rescue of the Yazidi population uh, in 2014, uh, different Kurdish groups worked together and collaborated and coordinated together to, and in the case of Kobani as well. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's there. I think in any political movement, you know, you have internal divisions and, um, and, and connections and yeah, so. But it's such a huge geography, and I guess you know. Uh, yeah, there are multiple factors that shape them. But anyway, I'll I'll try to I'll stop. There's an interesting question about the right to self determination. If you, if it could be argued that uh, the right of se to self determination of peoples is evolving again and focused on decolonization of self and community, uh, deterritorialization away from topographical imaginaries and more towards mobility, etc., yeah. away from identity. 
how is Kurdish uh, framing of the project shifting into into such a future understanding? Uh, and I think there was yeah another question uh, related to the to this, which is is pan Kur is there something that we could call pan Kurdism uh, more possible than pan Arabism, which is a, a, a huge question. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but um, then, you know, if you could comment on the first one, yeah. uh, then we could see what other questions we have in relation to current politics. Yeah. Um, so um, there is definitely self-determination as an idea, you know, the self-determination, cultural self-determination, non-territorial self-determination, self-determination as mobility or ability to choose a more kind of individual uh, right-based, you know, uh, definitions and uses of self-determination are increasing um, and the kind of nation-state self-determination has definitely res less resonance now uh, you know in, in general so Kurds um, I think are not necessarily especially I would say Iraqi Kurdish political movement is not tapping to those new conceptions of self-determination necessarily uh, the uh, PKK model is not necessarily explicitly tapping to those conceptions, but in their ideology, in the way they define democracy, I think there's a lot of elements of self-determination uh, defined in that in that way. Self-determination, and I have to add, it's a very complex principle. It's it's it has a very complex history, and it has different meanings. You know, as a, as an ideology, as a as a political tool, as a, a as a principle, as a norm. Um, it's it, and it means different things in different contexts. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it there. But it's a it's a really good question. Um, what was the other question? I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, um, pan Kurdism, Pan Kurdism, and Pan Arabism. Ooh, I don't know. Uh, the person who asked this question, do they think that Pan Arabism is possible? Yeah, they can't. They probably need to put that, their answer. So we'll wait um, I was. Can I butt in uh, here? There was a, a question that I was thinking about. There, there were three questions that they're asking. A about the terminology that you use your book. Obviously, uh, someone who's not read your book first, that um, they're interested in how you use, um, you know, Turkish Kurds or Iranian Kurds or Syrian Kurds um, or so on. They wanted to know what terminology did you use. In your book, did you use, for example, northern, southern, eastern, western, and it's uh, and they're wondering that when um, you know scholars, academics, or whoever, when they refer to these um, Kurds as part of the larger countries that surround them, does not does that not reinforce the um, current borders of the larger towns? And I think it, related to that, there is someone else uh, question. That again says that when you um, uh, are talking about the different levels of autonomy in different parts, again, Turkish, Iraqi, Syrian, and Iranian parts of Kurdistan, would that not gradually lead to the fragmentation of a Kurdish culture and therefore will make the idea of a, um, a concept of a Kurdish state disappear further and oil? So a couple of people are wondering whether you can just touch upon oil in this region and vis-a-vis -vis autonomy or independence. I'll, I'll go quiet again. I was just, I couldn't resist those questions because I was also thinking about the concept of Kurds under the four states that um, surround them. Yeah, I'll take the terminology concept. Uh, yes, it's it's very loaded. Any terminology you use in this context, you know, they use Bakur or they use, uh, you know, Rojava or do you use Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, sure, Turkey, yeah. Kurdistan, Kurd Kurdistan or not? Um, I try to uh, avoid those terminologies and say, you know, talk, talk about Kurds in Turkey or uh, talk about Kurdish political actors uh, using their names or or organizations rather than relating them to a particular um, uh, state territory, but, you know, trying to, but, you know, and to, when I talk about rather than Iraqi Kurdistan or uh, Iraqi Kurdistan is more accepted because it's a region in the, in the Iraqi, Iraq, the Kurdistan regional government and the, Kurd, the, the, the Kurdistan region of Iraq. 
Um, but the others are, you know, mainly Kurds in Turkey, Kurds in Syria, or Kurdish political actors in Syria, in Turkey. So that's what I tried to do. I hope I did it consistently, because when you're writing, sometimes, you know, you just like write things without realizing. But that was kind of what I was trying to do. In terms of the different, absolutely, these, you know, they have been, Kurds have been living in these four different countries with different political cultures. Uh, you know, with different ideological doctrinations and national doctrinations and historical socioeconomic contexts in about 100 years. And 100 years obviously has a significant role in the way in which it shapes the, um, the, the way Kurdish, uh, Kurdish people would position themselves uh, in terms of identity, in terms of political affiliation and so on and so forth. Uh, and this has led to, you know, as you can see, you know, the Kurdish political actors in each region, they have very different characteristics and goals and, and types of activities that they carry out. Um, so that's one thing. So that's definitely the case. Um, however, um, I think even a nation state, whenever, you know, if um, the geography is, is very mixed, it's a big geography. And um, I think in any in any context, even in the UK or in another country, you see different cultural identities or different cultural uh, characteristics emerging. You know, there is not doesn't mean that you know you, states don't or or a nation doesn't have to have a unified identity to be a nation. Um, and because I define nation in more kind of constructive terms, it's about what people choose to be uh, and how they want to define themselves and how they their socioeconomic background is shaping them rather than you're born with it and you have to kind of maintain a unified, stick to the same kind of identity to be able to continue to exist and survive. Um, so I, I think the, being in different states is not necessarily, um, it, it's an impediment maybe in many ways, but at the same time, you know, the Kurdish diaspora has done a lot of work to maintain that kind of identity, you know, change, you know working on the vernaculars, Kurdish Kurmanchi and Sorani vernaculars to create uh, a shared kind of uh, language, but also uh, the communication tools and, and being able to travel, you know, the, the, that has definitely connected. Um, so even though different Kurdish groups in different states might have different characteristics or goals, but the sense of a Kurdish identity or shared identity is there. You know, it, it is, it, you know, there is no denying that, I think. I mean, um, and that sense of shared identity is actually um, quite, you know, uh, increasing. So there is this, you know, opposite direct, opposite things happening as, as, as always, you know, social processes and politics are quite complex and you have unifying forces, but at the same time divide, you know, diversifying forces and they just work together to create this complex situation. Um, so um, that's all I will say on that oil, oil, <laughs> Uh, I, I guess, you know, the Kirkuk is issue is, is the main, I think, reference here that's been talked about. Um, and I think, you know, for um, the Iraqi Kurdistan's viability, you know, oil is a key. And the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, disputed territories and the oil issue has been a key issue, I guess, in Iraqi Kurdistan in shaping their relationship with the Baghdad government uh, and also in uh, creating um, the mar the marketing the the counters of, of, of the Kurdish goal and and the viability of a future Kurdish state so it's kind of I think they are very much embedded the idea of oil and uh, territory and Kirkuk is very much embedded in the uh, idea of a you know state building uh, in the long term for Kurdistan and I think that's all I will say about about that. Yes, yeah. I just, before I, I give um, the uh, floor back to Dina to carry with question, there is a question, several questions from uh, Lady Belinda. I just use her first and uh, possibly with an affinity with the region and understanding. And she says, I have I'm looking at, at a map on my wall, uh, which is 1740. Uh, and she was uh, obviously referring that obviously the mapping of Kurdistan perhaps is not a very recent effect event. It's uh, the region has been preoccupying the cartographers, you know. Yeah, so yeah, there are several maps produced by um, mappers, geographers, colonial officers, um, and also um, 
entrepreneurs and uh, you know those who want to invest in the region and you know uh, so they, there are lots of maps produced in the 18th century Italians for instance um, and the French um, the English Germans Russians they all have maps uh, produced in the UNDAT in that period and I was going to mention it earlier for instance Zeki Pasha who is a um, who's originally from um, Iraq, Iraq, the Iraq section, but that, then that was Ottoman Empire. Uh, he produced a map in 1934 um, that was very much uh, relying on the uh, on the colonial maps of the history, of the old periods. And before the physical maps were produced, uh, Kurdistan it was also defined in um, in terms of you know boundaries. So to the south, it ends in this river, and you know that kind of definition, for instance, by um, by Sherifan uh, Bitlisi um, in the 16th century and and before that as well so it has not only been mapped but also visual you know verbally mapped uh, as well um th uh, thank you nagas for for bringing these points really important ones um but also there's a question about the diaspora you know since we're talking about curves in, in different parts uh, of uh, of kind of the vicinity of the region so what about the curves in diaspora and uh, you know the the uh, the question wanted to have more, uh, you know, more engagement with that. And, and the question said, uh, since you use the term ideological territoriality, have you stepped upon or came to the assumption of certain territorial enclaves of Kurds within continental Europe? Uh, to clarify, is it fair to say that engagement of Kurdish diaspora in Europe is somehow beyond conven conventional territorialities? Um, and then again, you know, sort of how, how can, is, is it fair to make assumptions that specific cities, towns within Europe have a stronger influence by such a diaspora in all aspects? So um, have you looked into that? And uh, yeah, I think if you could answer that quickly and then we'll move on to some others. Yeah, Di diaspora, diaspora organizations talk about the unified Kurdistan or a greater Kurdistan, that idea more. They use the map, the symbolic map more often than, than the regional actors as well. Um, and um, especially in the, among the younger generation uh, that's particularly visible. Um, the, uh, the, the, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, the, the Kurds in Paris was very, very, very effective. And the first Kurdish Institute was established in Paris. Uh, by Syrian uh, Kurds um, after the French mandate and ended, they came to France and they established. And then Stockholm is another city, London, uh, Brussels. Um, uh, so these are they, but they they are the Kurdish political actors and diaspora political actors are present in in all cities in Europe, also in uh, in the US. Uh, in Australia, but I would say these cities have been the most influential. There, they have organizations, they have formed in you know, established libraries, uh, they carry out activities, awareness raising activities, they also carry out lobbying activities, um, particularly in, in, Brus in Brussels, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, and then in terms of, um, yeah, so I'd hope that answers that question yeah. briefly. <laughs> Uh, and there's a question about the Lausanne Treaty, uh, whether that has been, uh, you know, to, uh, the one to reorganize Turkish borders. And do you believe that this moment could be given as, a, as could be seen as a turning point about on Kurdish uh, nationalism? And then in terms on, of- on, on Kurdish? Is it? Yeah. Is, could this be seen? The question says, do you believe this moment could be given as a turning point about Kurdish nationalism struggling for a greater uh, Kurdish state? And another question is around whether the frame, using the frame of indigenous people to describe uh, Kurds would be pertinent in the current, um, in the current uh, you know, uh, world con contemporary conditions. Um, and then, yeah. Um, Okay, I think if you could answer those two questions and sure, then sure. Uh, there's, there's an interesting question about the methodologies of your work. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between uh, historical elements and contemporary cartography and its users. But for example, uh, talking about the usage and popularity of particular Kurdistan maps contemporarily, what is the base, basis for your work here? Ethnographic research, media research or something else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so about the Lausanne Treaty, um, until until the Lausanne Treaty, there was still there were still possible discussions, especially held between the British and Kurdish, some of the Kurdish leaders, uh, around a, a formation of a Kurdistan uh, north of Mesopotamia. Uh, but uh, over time, you know, especially after the World War, you know, World War One ended, uh, the British became more and more interested in the southern Mesopotamia, uh, and kind of didn't want to deal with the Turks uh, in a way, or they didn't want to. Uh, so the idea that there was an idea of having a buffer zone, uh, a Kurdish buffer zone between the Turks and and the British uh, controlled Mesopotamia, so. Those discussions, all of them ended in the end with the Lausanne, uh, the possibility of uh, the viability of, uh, for, of forming a, a Kurdistan uh, autonomous or an, as an independent state ended with, with, the, with the establishment of, of the Lausanne Treaty. Um, and, uh, and basically it's, it's, a, it's a sign, it's, 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 an it's important because it's basically a proof that the British totally gave up on the idea of supporting uh, the formation of a, of a Kurdistan, uh, not only within the Mesopotamia, Iraq, but also uh, outside it. Indigenous, um, well, I have looked at this literature very briefly, uh, and I'm, I wouldn't consider myself as an expert about indigenous self-determination. Um, so my answer would not be necessarily very much well-founded uh, and an informed answer. Um, uh, so, um, in terms of you know, you know, still having lands, uh, possessions, uh, political influence, and political power, you know, when you look at Eastern Turkey, as for instance, or Northern Iraq, or um, you know, the Kurdish populations and political actors uh, on the ground in these areas are uh, powerful. Uh, in, in, in some ways. Uh, not, I'm not talking about all the populations, but there are kind of uh, elite, Kurdish political elite in those areas. Uh, so in a way, you know, they haven't been deprived entirely of their, of their possessions or, or rights. Um, but of course, I'm not saying that their rights have been violated, not, not, not they haven't been violated or they have been displaced, they have been expelled from their villages, um, and they have been forcefully moved from one part of a country to another, you know, those things also happen. So um, maybe those, you know, we, we need to look into those um, indigenous arguments and I guess look into empirical cases and see, you know, maybe rather than generalizing to all the Kurds, uh, maybe certain Kurdish groups might have experience uh, processes that might account for that kind of description and um, but as i said it, this is an uninformed answer um but in terms of suffering and in terms of this possession and and uh, processes that look like colonization uh, you know those processes have taken place uh, in the region uh, but is it the same way or is it was it the same exactly the same processes that happened in the us or in australia uh, I don't know. Uh, I haven't studied those contexts. Um, in terms of mapping and methodology, yes, my methodology. Um, so I'm not making the claim that these maps have been accepted by everyone, and it's just that um, based on. Um, so you know, I looked at the pro political programs of political actors in the diaspora in the politic in the in the region, uh, how they use this map, whether they have used this map or not. Um, and then also uh, uh, through some of the uh, international uh, publications, particularly um, uh, you know the Washington Post, um, Economist, and and some of the state offices, um, U.S. U.S. State Departments, or how so. And I have examples, but my empirical research on this is not generalizable at all. Uh, however, um, the arguments behind these users is what I'm interested in and how these are framed uh, to promote this idea of Kurdistan is what I'm interested in. Um, and in order to understand that, my methodology was a historical sociology uh, and long durée analysis of, uh, of the transformation of ideas um, and, and in relation to politics and how and embedding this uh, uh, the, the, the Kurdish political agenda within that long durée transformation. 
so that's what I try to do. And um, I, when I was writing the book, I, you know, it's just that kind of methodology is 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 um, is quite vague. Uh, and because I looked at such a large geography, including the diaspora and very long historical process, my work ended up being quite general. Uh, but I have an IR background, and I'm kind of you know interested in you know this big picture and generalizable things. So empirically. Uh, I wouldn't say my work is um, very um, empirically driven. I, it's more kind of big picture explanation and a bit more conceptual and theoretically driven <clears throat> by uh, using the, the, the story of Kurdistan to understand the historical transformation of the inter international context in relation to that and vice versa, how they interacted with each other. And going beyond the state analysis and making a connection between the international context and the non-state context or sub-state or transnational, because Kurdish nationalism also has a very transnational dimension, as we talked about, you know, pan-Kurdishness, does it exist in the minds of PKK leaders? Pan-Kurdism definitely exists, for instance. So it's also a transnational uh, movement, especially the activities of diaspora. So that's what I try to do methodologically. Um, so I, obviously I have this weakness of, you know, as an IR historical sociology kind of, it's, it's quite general uh, in that sense, yeah. That's interesting. So there is a book to be made in terms of looking how do Kurds, uh, sorry, yeah, how do they see, how do they imagine the maps and so on. I have another question and then I let in Anagus because I think I might have missed a few. Um, one question is about, you know, Kurdish mm -hmm. imagination of what a capital of the territory of Greater Kurdistan has changed historically uh, based on political and military dynamics in the region and the specific developments in each of the four states of Turkey, Iran, Iraq and Syria. By capital, I mean the political and nationalist imagination of a metropolitan center for Kurdish str struggle and unity. How did shifting the territory of the capital Im imp impacted the various manifestation of the map of Greater Kurdistan. So I think the question is not very clear, but what I understand it as is um, how, um, you know, basically, uh, is there an imagination of a capital? Is there a center uh, that kind of brings together this map, uh, if I understood the question correctly? I think it depends on the historical context you're talking about. So in the, in the Ottoman Empire, for instance, during that period in the um, early 1800s, um, a, a Kurdistan province was formed and its capital was Diyarbakir, um, Ahmed, um, in, in, the, um, it's in the southeast of Turkey. Um, and it, Diyarbakir is still considered as, as, as a capital by many Kurdish Kurdish people, I suppose, you know, and I like Kurdish political actors as well. There is a strong um, uh, political activism in in, in that context. Um, so Diyarbakir, I would say, Ahmed is is a, is a key one. Still, is is very um, central. Um, Erbil has also become quite uh, prominently because, especially after the 1991, with the formation of the no-fly zone. Um, and you know the formation establishment of universities. Um, you know the the Arbil has become a, a kind of a window to open up to the global world in, in some way. So those scholars who are interested in the Kurds or Turk Kurds in Turkey, for instance, were able to travel to Arbil, you know, make connections. So it's become a like a hub for uh, in, in, in enabling interconnections between the Kurdish the Kurdish groups in, in the region. But also uh, making a con enabling a connection between the Kurds and uh, Kurdish political actors and outsiders. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I think Arbil has a different kind of dynamic. Uh, I would say it's one of the key. Uh, but as a capital, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it depends on who you ask and when when you ask them, I guess. And uh, yeah, that's interesting. Narkis, do you want to come in? I was just, there was one uh, couple of questions like this, which is slightly moving away from maps, but it's about internal migrations that do you see now, especially with what we call it Iraqi Kurdistan, are you aware of or is there a monitoring of assessing of the 
uh, movement of other Kurdish uh, societies, communities, people trying to move there? Um, and if so, what is the reception? I suppose there was another question that perhaps um, alluded to the internal conflicts that how would they, how welcoming would uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, which has much more of an almost autonomous uh, authority be towards accepting other Kurds? And is there much desire of other communities to move there or are they rooted to where they reside, whether it's Iran, Turkey, Syria? Again, my answer will be uh, based on um, my very narrow observations. Uh, so I won't be able to make generalizations and my answer will be anecdotal. Um, but, you know, in the context of, for instance, I looked into displacement, internal displacement and refugees in, in Iraqi Kurdistan for a couple of years, and I visited the region um, a couple of times a year for, for five years or so. Um, and um, when I, you know, when I talked with uh, Kurds from Syria, from coming from Rojava, um, at their integration, uh, their re you know, and the, the reception that they received from from authorities and from the Kurds in Iraq were different, whereas the um, Arabs coming from Syria were, uh, you know, received differently. So there is definitely a sense of kinship there, but also, um, for instance, in Dohuk, um, and they, you know, they, they were also able to speak the language. Uh, so they were able to find jobs and integrate easier and so on and so forth. Whereas for uh, Arabs, they had the language barrier uh, in the displacement context. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's kind of, that would be the only, you know, reasonable empirical basis that I could rely on. But in general, I don't know, for instance, in the context of um, Iranian Kurds coming to Turkey or uh, or other places. Um, I think there is a, there is a sense of shared kinship, I suppose. I mean, I mean, and on the, in the, the Erbil and Suleimani and Dohuk has received um, uh, you know other Kurds from other parts of the region uh, a lot, and they are coming to study. They are coming to visit. Um, and they open businesses and and carry out work and live and so on and so forth. So it's it's um, it's something that's kind of I, from what I understand from what I observe is a normal thing. So when I even though I, I'm not entirely Kurdish, I have Kurdish background, but I'm not. Uh, uh, but I'm from the region. I'm from one. Uh, and when I go to Erbil or Dohuk and I say I'm from one, they just like oh. You know, they, I, it's a much warmer kind of reception, which is the kind of, you know, when you're doing research, it's not always useful. Uh, you're, you, that, you know, it's just kind of, kind of position yes. that complicates the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, I think there is definitely, a, in what I, from what I saw, the positive. Well, that, I think, yeah. But there's one of the uh, people is commenting that, I mean, I have to say, we have record number, near record number of questions, 75, and someone says that, Zainab, you'll just have to come back, because we've, I think, <laughs> only touched upon some of the questions. So, anyway, I'll pass it on back to Dina, who may want to wrap up the... I was going to wrap up with the same comment, saying that there's so many questions, we need another se session on maps of Kurdistan because we had a lot of questions on politics and referendum and so on. But I think the talk was kind of more wide, wide ranging and uh, kind of historically grounded um, and theoretically grounded. So uh, very many thanks to you uh, for you know, your uh, elegance and eloquence and also for writing this book, which we are all looking forward to. I was already beginning to think as a Palestinian, okay, so how do you, you know, mapping Palestine, you know, kind of, kind of thinking about the idea of mapping, and but it's so original uh, as research and an, an idea that brings people together. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, Nargis, for coming to my- No, at all. Thank you for leading. Thank you, Zaid Arjuna. Thank you to our amazing audience who are still here. They haven't I disappeared. Wish I, <laughs> I wish I had more time and I tried to keep my answers short, but I'm uh, really uh, delighted that I was able to talk about the book and you know hear all these very interesting questions. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and it was a pleasure to talk uh, and engage with you. 
and giving for giving me the opportunity to talk about my books. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you for everyone who asked questions. I'm um, I wish I could we could go through all of them. Would it be possible to um, make and record the questions? So Absolutely, that... copy and paste them. And <laughs> yes, I think talking. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to um, look, no. at, look at them. Much. No, definitely. I think there's some very interesting because some have referred to books or sources that they are aware of that they think might be of interest to you. So we can certainly copy and paste them to send them to you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's coming. The book is coming out as a paper copy. So it's right now it's in hard copy and very expensive. I, well, well, you could hold it up to camera. We could perhaps yeah. like to see it. Oh, that would be very nice. Yeah, very, and with a lovely map there. Yeah. It's coming out <laughs> as, a, as a paper copy, much cheaper <laughs> later. So hopefully <laughs> it will be correct. It's ridiculously expensive at the moment. Um, but yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity and thank you for, uh, for all the questions. Okay, thanks all and thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Good.